So uh, the first thing that I learned about innovation is that true innovation occurs when you decide to make meaning uh, as opposed to money. I think that the way it works in the world is if you make meaning, you improve people's lives, then the natural consequence of that is that, huh, you'll make money. But if you, if you focus on simply making money, you'll attract the wrong kind of people, the wrong kind of values, the wrong kind of priorities. And you'll probably fail, and you'll make neither money nor meaning. So I want you to focus on how you can make meaning. So I have some examples of some companies and the meaning that they make. So I think with Apple, you know, the meaning that they made is that they brought computers to everybody. It, it made it possible so that you didn't have to work for a large company. You didn't have to work for a university or go to a university. You didn't have to work for the government. So, you know, Apple made the world a better place. Google, duh, democratized information, right? All information out there. Between Google and Wikipedia, I mean, we have it all. It's democratized knowledge and information. What a great way to make meaning. And Canva, Canva is democratizing design. So at the start of my career, I democratized computing. At the end of my career, I'm democratizing design. I hope some of you use Canva already. This is a great, great product. But the point is, make meaning. Second thing is to make a mantra. Now, uh, many companies, particularly in America, uh, they do something like this. This is not a mantra. This is a mission statement. I don't know how you do it here, but in America, what we do is we take the top 10% of the company to an off-site. This off-site is typically held at a resort hotel with a golf course. There's a very high correlation, mission statement and golf course. And you, you have a room like this, and you take your top employees, and you have two days, it's two days to make a mission statement. The first day is spent in cross-functional teams. Cross-functional teams is a code word for saying that you're partnered up in teams with people you can't stand at the same company. <laughs> so for example, engineering is working with sales, right? And, and you form these cross-functional teams, and you have an off-site meeting facilitator. Typically, it's a woman uh, in Silicon Valley. It's, this is not sexism or misogynism. This is just a statement of fact. Typically, it's a woman. She's usually on a dual-track career. She's both an executive coach, meeting facilitator, uh, as well as a uh, Lamaze instructor. And, and the reason is very obvious. It's because pushing out a baby is very much like pushing out a mission statement. And so the first day is spent in cross-functional teams where you learn to trust each other. Uh, you close your eyes, and you fall backwards into the arms of, God help you, a marketing person. <laughs> and so at the end of this day, now you, you know, you're really completing each other's sentences, kumbaya, with the people you couldn't stand at the start of the day. The second day, you're in a room like this. is a big pad of paper, and Moonbeam, the meeting facilitator, um, <laughs> she walks you through the the exercise of creating this mission statement. And I have to tell you, by the second day, most people are thinking, I just gave up two days of my life to be in this stupid outdoor exercise thing, and now we're writing a mission statement, so I deserve at least one word in the mission statement. So if you have 50 or 60 employees in the audience, 50 or 60 word mission statement. That's what it is. And so, now let's read this. The mission of Wendy's. Now, Wendy's is a fast food restaurant, okay? So, you know, wrap your mind around this. This is a fast food restaurant. The mission of Wendy's is to deliver superior quality products and services for our customers and communities through leadership, innovation, and partnerships. Like, what? <laughs> Come again? You know, I, listen, I have four children. I love Wendy's. I love fast food. I love Tim Tams, too, but that's a different discussion. <laughs> so, so you, you know, I've eaten at Wendy's. I've driven through Wendy's. I've done the whole Wendy's thing. I love Wendy's. Don't get me wrong. But in all those times that I've been at Wendy's, it has never occurred to me that, God, you are participating in leadership, innovation, and partnerships. <laughs> you know, I just thought I was getting a cheeseburger. <laughs> Lo and behold, it was leadership, innovation, and partnership. This is what's wrong with mission statements. This is when you do an off-site. This is when you hire a high-end consulting firm to help you form your mission statement. So what I want you to do is create a mantra, two or three words that explain why your innovation, really why you should exist at all. So Wendy's could be healthy fast food, 
right? Three words that describe why Wendy is existing. Uh, Nike, authentic athletic performance. It's all about getting athletes the equipment for them to increase their performance. That's what Nike stands for. Just do it is their slogan. But why does Nike exist? Authentic athletic performance. And FedEx, when you absolutely positively you want something someplace, when you want peace of mind, FedEx. So I want you to try to create a mantra for your company, your product, your service, your innovation. Two or three words that explains why it should exist. The next thing is to jump to the next curve. This is all about perspective. If there's one thing that Steve Jobs taught me, it is that great innovation occurs on the next curve, not by duking it out on the same curve. Classic analog example, ICE 1.0, 1900, Bubba and Junior, the great-great-grandfather of the people voting for Donald Trump. They go out <laughs> with a saw and a sleigh and a horse, and they cut blocks of ice. Nine million pounds harvested. This is a major innovation. Now you could have ice in your house. Hmm. How much more convenient. 30 years go by, ice 2.0. Now there's an ice factory. It didn't have to be winter. It didn't have to be cold. You could have an ice factory in Sydney. You could have an ice factory in Tasmania. This is good. Radical change. Refrigeration is the next curve, though. And on this next curve, it's even better. Because now you're not dependent on an ice factory with an ice man delivering ice in an ice truck. You had your own personal chiller, your own PC in your house. No more delivery. The very interesting story is that none of the ice harvesters became ice factories. And none of the ice factories became refrigerator companies. Because most entities define themselves in terms of what they already do. So if you're Kodak, you say, huh, we slap chemicals upon paper. That paper is exposed to light. And then we develop that paper and we give it back to the customer. That's the business we're in. Similarly, Polaroid. I mean, how many of you use Kodak or Polaroid today? How many of you use Smith Corona? How many of you use National Cash Register? How many of you use Remington Rand? How many of you have even heard of these things, right? It's most companies, they define themselves in terms of what they already do. If you define yourself as we slap chemicals upon a piece of paper that is exposed to light, excuse me, a piece of plastic that is exposed to light, and then we develop it and send it back, then you probably don't embrace digital photography in time. You got to get to the next curve. For those of you in large, established companies, you've got to imagine that there are two guys in a garage, two gals in a garage, a guy and a gal in a garage, someplace, who are creating a product or service that might kill you. That's what you should always keep in mind. Next point is to roll the dice. This is the features, this is the main things that define great products and services. First, depth. Great products and services are deep. This is a deep sandal, believe it or not. Every sandal's purpose is to protect your feet. But this thing on this sandal makes this a deep sandal. Because this thing is a metal clip, and that metal clip opens beer bottles. <laughs> this sandal has twice the depth of any other sandal in the world. Great products, great services are also intelligent. When you look at it, you say, my God, this company understood my pain. This company understood the problem. This company was way ahead of me in thinking. Uh, Mercedes-Benz has a very interesting thing. They have this technology called pre-safe. So when the car detects that it is about to have a collision, it puts out a very loud noise. And that loud noise prepares your ear for the even louder noise of the accident. And this first loud ear causes your ear, the first loud noise causes your ear to prep itself for the next loud noise. Very intelligent idea. Great products, great services are also complete. And we are, I mean, if, if there is an example of completeness, my God, who would be better than Google, right? It's, it's not just search, it's, it's analytics. It's doc, it's surveys, it's photos, it's presentations, it's everything. It's Google Enterprise. Talk about a complete product, a complete service, a complete company. It's cars, it's everything. It's Chromebooks, it's Nexus. 
Oh my God, it's Android, it's operating systems, completeness. E is elegance. Great products, great services are elegant. It's the Eames chair. Somebody cared about the user interface. So as you try to jump curves, you know, ask your team, ask yourself, are we creating something that's deep, intelligent, complete, empowering, and elegant? Are we rolling the dicey? Next thing is don't worry, be crappy. This I stole from Bobby McFerrin. Bobby McFerrin's song is don't worry, be happy. But what I learned at Apple is that innovation requires don't worry, be crappy, which is to say that at the start of a great revolution, at the start of a curve, it won't be perfect. And it's okay. Now, I'm not saying you should ship crap. I'm saying that you should ship something that is 10x better, but it can have elements of crappiness to it. The first Macintosh had 128K of RAM, very slow network. Thanks to my efforts, there was no software. The storage was 400K. We were working on a secret five megabyte hard disk. Our biggest question was, what were people gonna do with five megabytes of storage? My God, that's so much storage. Arguably, it was a piece of crap, but it was a revolutionary piece of crap. And that's the way you should look at it. Don't worry, be crappy. Number five is to let 100 flowers blossom. This I stole from Chairman Mao. I'm not sure he implemented it, but letting 100 flowers blossom in my context means that at the start of innovation, you may not know exactly who's going to use your product and what they're going to do with it. And you may be tempted to think that you can control what ultimately happens to your product and service. And I think that is a delusion. You should take your best shot, positioning and branding, but ultimately people determine what it is. And so what I'm trying to tell you here is don't be proud. With Macintosh, we tried to make it a spreadsheet, database, and word processing machine for Fortune 500 companies. We were zero for three there. Luckily, there was this product called PageMaker, and PageMaker created a forest called desktop publishing, and desktop publishing is what kept Apple alive. No desktop publishing, no Apple. Imagine a world without Apple, right? Our phones would last beyond 3 p.m. What a concept, <laughs> right? We'd have real keyboards. You could put it in your jeans, it wouldn't bend. What a concept. You could use uh, the Apple GPS system and you'd actually get someplace. I mean, you know, I use Google Maps, I, so what can I say? Because so, I need to really get to where I want to go. You know, what a concept, right? <laughs> so, my point here is that let 100 flowers blossom. Take your best shot at positioning and branding. But if the world tells you you have a desktop publishing machine, not a spreadsheet database and a word processing machine, Hallelujah, take the money, declare victory. The way it works in Silicon Valley, just so you know, because you're on the outside looking in, I'll explain from the inside looking out. You know, the way it works in Silicon Valley is we throw a lot of shit against the wall and some of it sticks and then we go to the wall, we paint the bullseye around it and we say, we hit the bullseye. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you, that's how it works, okay? I, I hate to burst the bubble for you, but that is literally how it works. Um, number six is to polarize people. So this is a picture of a TiVo. And uh, TiVo, and now Comcast has their own uh, DVR, uh, it time shifts programs. But this is something that I learned that innovation polarizes people. I love my TiVo. I love my Comcast. I have both. I love them because they time shift stuff because I travel so much. But there are people who hate this kind of stuff because people like me, we never watch advertising, literally. I never watch an ad. I am skipping it, I am fast forwarding it every time. So people like me, we love our DVRs. People who are brands and people who are ad agencies hate that because we don't watch advertising. Macintosh polarizes people. Android polarizes people. Personally, I think that there are many parts of Android that are better than iOS and, and you know, you get into this religious battles, and some people like, they're trying to make everybody happy, and it's just not possible. And I think the worst case is that nobody cares. And so if you are polarizing people, it's okay. Great innovation polarizes people. I love TiVo, I love certain kind of cars, it's okay. It's okay, as long as people are talking about you, as long as people are complaining, you're still in the game, okay? 
Don't be afraid of polarizing people. Number seven is stolen from the Black Panthers, which is churn, baby, churn, as opposed to burn, baby, burn. And by this, I mean that one of the hardest steps for an innovator is to take version one of your next curve and then make it 101, 1.1, and then even harder, get to the next curve, 2.0. Churning is a very hard thing. A lot of it is because you put so much energy and so much emotion into shipping and you're so exhausted that you can't even think about fixing it, right? This is the hardest things. But what separates great companies from mediocre companies is the ability to take version one and keep fixing it relentlessly. Number eight is all the marketing you need to know. This is to niche thyself. Vertical axis is uniqueness. Horizontal axis is value. So let's just step through this a little bit. So if you're in this corner, it means that you have something valuable but not unique. In this corner, you always have to compete on price. In this corner, where it's unique but not valuable, well, that's a bigger problem because now you've created something and nobody cares about it. In that corner, you're just plain stupid. In this corner, you are stupid and it's crowded because in that corner, <laughs> you have built something that nobody cares about and other stupid people have been funded by more stupid people to do the same stupid, useless thing. So really, the corner you want to be in is that upper right-hand corner because that's where you're unique and valuable. Fandango is a movie ticket buying service where I live for the theaters we always go to. That's the only way I can buy a ticket and print it at home or put it on my phone. But it's valuable because when you take four kids to a movie, you really don't want to get there and find that it's sold out. It's worth a buck and a half per ticket for me to do that. Fandango is unique and valuable. So remember, you have to compete on price here. You're stupid up there. You're freaking dot .com down here, right? Pets.com, you know, you're selling dog food online. It's not unique because stupid people like me funded pets.com, mypets.com, lastminutepets.com, epets.com. And then it's not valuable because, yes, you made pet food cheaper, but then, hmm, you made it cheaper by taking away the pet food store. You disintermediated the analog pet food store, but the dead cow in the can is still in the factory. It's still in the warehouse. How are we getting the dead cow in the can to the customer if we take away the pet food store? Aha, we have to ship it. So come to find out, you discount the price by disintermediating the store, but then you add shipping and handling, so effectively you pay the same amount, right? So it's not valuable and it's not unique. The corner you want to be in is that upper right-hand corner, Breitling Emergency Watch. The Breitling Emergency Watch, you unscrew this knob over here, whip it out, and out comes a wire. It starts broadcasting an emergency signal. This emergency signal is caught by airplanes. So when they see that signal, they think, huh, emergency in the United States anyway. You know, Kevin Costner gets in the Coast Guard helicopter. It's coming down in a wire basket looking for you, okay? This is a unique and valuable watch. This watch can save your life. There are not many watches that can save your life. One more example of unique and value. This is a smart car. All of us have cars that can park what? Parallel. How many of you have a car that can park perpendicular? Not too many. If, tight, if parking is really tight, smart cars, a unique and valuable thing. So I guess I'm telling you that from an engineering standpoint, the, the role is to make something unique and valuable. From a marketing standpoint, it's to convince the world that what you have is unique and valuable. It's all you need to know about marketing. Number nine. Number nine is to perfect your pitch. If you want to be an innovator, if you want to change the world, you have to be able to pitch. This is something that separated Steve Jobs from everybody. He was the greatest pitchman in the world. It was not clear to me that Steve Jobs could foresee what people would come to need. That's theory A. Theory B is he made whatever the hell he wanted to make and convinced people that they wanted it too. That's theory B of Steve Jobs. I kind of subscribe to theory B. But the point here is that Steve could pitch. So let me talk about pitching and speaking and presenting. The first is to customize your intro. You should be able to know everybody in your audience, what their background is, what school they went to, where they worked, where they currently work. 
customize the intro. You're looking for common points. If it's a large audience like this, uh, I think one of the best ways to do it is to use pictures. Right? So I showed you a picture of my son playing hockey one kilometer from here against your team. Right? I'm trying to show you that I have thought about this. I would not have used that picture in Canada or the United States. It's only relevant here. This is a picture of an LG washer and dryer. I was in South America. I was speaking to the management of LG, and I used this picture to introduce my speech. Talking to LG, you show your LG washer and dryer in your house, warms up the crowd, opens it all up, right? Now, there's a back channel story to this. So I was in Brazil, and I didn't have the pictures. I mean, not too many people carry a picture of their washer and dryer with them, you know? So I needed this picture, and I have four children. That Two older boys are 23 and 21. So I, I sent a message to them, and I said, you know, go down in a, well, first of all, just pause, just pause Call of Duty that I bought you on the Xbox that I bought you. Go downstairs in the house that I bought you <laughs> with the iPhones that I bought you. Take a picture of the washer and dryer that I bought you. I need it in 45 minutes because I'm about to speak. Send this to my two older boys. How many of you have teenage boys? So half hour goes by, what happens? Nothing. That's right, nothing. So next slide to set it up. Older boy's name is Nick. Younger boy is Noah, okay? Nick Noah. Send a message to Nick. I say, Nick, did you get my text messages? Nick says, well, yeah, Noah said he would take the pictures. Since, since you're talking to LG, can you get us some TVs? <laughs> yeah, welcome to my life. He's probably asking me for a Chromebook right now on my phone. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, Noah, God bless him, delivered, sent me the pictures. He's getting now more than 25% of my estate. <laughs> Life is good. Life is good. Another picture, Russia. When I spoke in Russia, I opened up with this speech, and I, this picture, and I said, you know, I had no idea. Man, you Russians, you really have big balls, man. <laughs> and this is before Ukraine. This is before people were reading in Hillary's email. And this is another illustration of this concept. This is a picture of me in the Grand Bazaar of Istanbul. It's a fantastic place. And I was speaking to Turkcell. I opened up with this picture. You know, speaker showing a picture in the Grand Bazaar of Istanbul, wearing a fez. The guy behind me is a shopkeeper. Look how happy that guy is. You know what that guy's thinking? That guy's thinking, this dumbass American is going to buy this fez. <laughs> Stinking Fez has been in my family shop for three generations. I finally found somebody stupid enough to buy this Fez. Turkish people don't wear Fezes like that. This dumbass American is going to buy this Fez. Thank you, God, right? Anyway, Turkcell loved it. That's how you open up. Customize your intro. Next thing is to follow what I call the 10-20-30 rule. 10-20-30 rule is the optimal number of slides in a presentation is 10. 10. You'd be lucky to get 10 points across. Now, you're not a stupid audience. You're thinking, guy, you're such a hypocrite. You're telling us 10 slides. You're at number 50 here. What's up with that? <laughs> right? Isn't that what you're thinking? I know you're all quants, right? Okay. So let me explain. You are not me. Okay? 10 slides, you. <laughs> Next point. Next point, you should give these slides in 20 minutes. Yes, you have a 60-minute meeting, but many of you use the other operating system. And I know, having met with many people using the other operating system laptop, you need 40 minutes to make it work with the projector. <laughs> 30 points. 30 points is the minimum font size. My algorithm is the bigger the font, the more you have to say. The smaller the font, the less you have to say. Steve Jobs used 200-point font. 200 point font. A very good rule of thumb. Figure out who the oldest person is in, is in your audience. Divide his or her age by two. 60 year old people, 30 points. 50 year old people, 25 points. Pitching to a 16 year old, eight points. Okay. <laughs> 10 slides, 20 minutes, 30 points. Number 10. We're getting to the end. I know I'm, you know, I got this big thing that says time's up. What are you going to do? Not invite me back? <laughs> so. <laughs> Force me to use Bing. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Number 10 is don't, <laughs> don't let the bozos grind you down. Very important concept in innovation. Because the bozos are going to try to grind you down. They're going to try to tell you it can't be done, it shouldn't be done, it isn't necessary. 
two kinds of bozos in the world. There's the slovenly disgusted pocket protector, body odor, loser bozo driving a rusty car with Japanese watch. You look at that person and say, wow, you are a loser. That's not the dangerous bozo because only a loser would listen to a loser. So if you're a loser and you listen to a loser, you deserve to be a loser. But you're not a loser, so you wouldn't listen to a loser. I'm not worried about that scenario. scenario I'm concerned about is the winner bozo. The winner bozo, rich, famous, dresses in all black, owns something that ends in I, like Lamborghini, Maserati, Ferrari, you know, Audi's okay, um, Armani. You know, and, and I think many people, they think that rich and famous parses to smart. And it can, it can, I'm not... You know, saying that it never does, but rich and famous often parses to lucky. So you have to be very careful about who you listen to when they tell you you cannot accomplish something. And I think that bozosity, which is what I call this, is just like the flu. And how do you prevent the flu? I want to inoculate you to bozosity, just like you get a vaccination. So I think, this wor there, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. Thomas Watson, five computers, five computers in the world. I have five Macs in my house. I have all the computers in the world, in, in my house. This telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. Western Union, internal memo. How many of you use Western Union lately? I didn't think so. How about PayPal? How about Square? How about Bitcoin? Any of those? Huh. It's hard to get from Telegraph to Square, Telegraph to Google Pay, if you write off telephone in the middle. It's too big a chasm to cross. There's no reason why anyone would want a computer in their home. Ken Olson, fantastic innovator, fantastic entrepreneur. Can't appreciate personal computers because he's so successful. Who would be a better advisor for a startup computer company than Ken Olson? But Ken Olsen wouldn't get the religion of personal computers because they were so successful with mini computers. It would be like asking the person who owns all the successful ice factories, why don't you go into the refrigerator business? There's no way they would jump to that curve. This is dangerous bullsocity. Ken Olson, fantastic, fantastic, successful innovator and entrepreneur. But he was so successful in one curve, he could not get to the next curve. To sort of summarize the art of enterprise innovation, it is all about making meaning, making the world a better place. It is about jumping to the next curve. You know, you want to be Kodak, you want to be Polaroid, you want to be Google, you want to be Airbnb, you want to be Uber, you know, you get to the next curve. Don't worry, be crappy. You don't have to be perfect on the next curve. You just have to be the next curve. But then you have to churn, baby, churn, the hardest thing. And don't forget my two-by-two two matrix. Your product or service has to be in that upper right-hand corner. Unique and valuable. That's where margin is. That's where meaning is. That's where money is. That's where history is. And above all, don't let the naysayers and bozos grind you down. I wish I could tell you whenever somebody tells you you'll fail, it means you'll succeed. That's not true. It's not true. It's not that easy. But if you listen to those people, you will never know. And that's the worst outcome of all. You will never know. And that is the art of enterprise innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.